Okay, you're good. Hello, and you're all very welcome uh, to the IGS Scientific uh, Program uh, for, for today, Changing Horizons in Gerontology, Improving Delirium Care in Acute Hospitals. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, and I have to acknowledge uh, Niamh O'Regan, who I will hand you over to shortly for the am amount of work that she's done in putting together today's program for everybody. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity as the president of the IGS to welcome Alistair, who is our external speaker, Alistair McCullough from Edinburgh. Uh, it's, I know he has a busy clinical schedule at the moment. He's done a lot of work in this area and we're really looking forward to hearing some of his research and translational work, which is changing clinical service in this context. And as I was reflecting on Alistair's work this morning, I, I recalled Jim George. Now, I don't know if any of you will remember Jim. He died a few years ago. He died a young consultant geriatrician. He was a consultant in Carlisle. But he was, as far as I'm aware, the first in the UK to establish dedicated delirium beds in Carlisle Hospital. He persuaded his uh, health authority at the time to fund dedicated beds and they grew. And his was the unit that everybody went to visit when we wanted to learn more about how to manage patients with delirium. He unfortunately died at a, at a, at a young age and I would just like to recognize the contribution that he made to kickstarting our work on delirium across these islands. Um, if I could also call uh, the members' attention to our new Ezine, which you will be receiving in your mailboxes. This is a fantastic new initiative. Again, it precedes me and was the brainchild of Dermot O'Shea, the past president and the executive. It's a wonderful, engaging, quarterly uh, Ezine. And I congratulate particularly Derek Hayden and May for the lovely production. So without further ado, I'm going to um, ask Niamh O'Regan to introduce our guests. But before I do, I want to introduce you to Niamh O'Regan. Niamh is a consultant geriatrician in Waterford and she completed her higher specialist training in 2015 and was awarded a PhD at UCC. Uh, she spent some time in Canada Again, her main area of research and clinical interest at that time and for her thesis was in delirium. And I remember doing ward rounds with May in St. James's where I was very well educated on the advances uh, in, in delirium. Um, she is particularly interested in improving quality of care for patients with de delirium and introducing algorithms and rolling these out for national use. So without further ado, I hand you over to Neva Regan and I thank Neva for organizing today and such a great panel of speakers. Thanks, Neva. Thanks very much, uh, Rosalind, for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank the IGS and um, Dermot and yourself, Rosanne, and May, Miriam, and everybody else involved um, for giving me this opportunity to organize this uh, webinar, which obviously is on a topic very close to my heart. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers um, from across various different disciplines. And as you've mentioned, we've also got um, Professor Alistair McLulloch um, uh, uh, as our kind of keynote lecture at the end of our webinar. Um, but first and foremost, I'd really like to introduce um, our uh, first speakers, uh, Cara McLaughlin and Louise Martin. Unfortunately, Louise um, is um, is, uh, is, not a, is not able to attend in person today. She pre-recorded her session. So Cara is actually gonna play her, her presentation. But uh, to introduce Louise, she's a senior physiotherapist at CUH, having completed her master's in physio at Robert Gordon University in 2012. She's been involved in setting up and implementing the frailty intervention um, therapy team in the ED and AMU and CUH and continues to work on this team. Now, both Cara and um, Louise were involved in the working group um, uh, to develop the National Delirium algorithms as part of the working group for dementia care pathways. Um, and, uh, and so and Cara is, uh, is also going to speak um, as part of this first, uh, first um, uh, presentation. She's an occupational therapist having graduated from Teesside in 2012. Um, she's previously worked in the UK and New Zealand and has lots of experience in setting up several different frailty intervention therapy teams 
and is currently working as a clinical specialist occupational therapist in care of the elderly uh, team in um, Beaumont Hospital. Um, she is currently completing her MSc in Older Persons Rehabilitation at UCC. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Cara, who's going to um, do her own talk and also uh, play uh, Louise's talk. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to IDS and especially to me for um, inviting myself and Louise along to this. It was great because uh, Louise and I worked together for a long time, so it was great for us to have a bit of time back together. Um, unfortunately, we're in the middle of an exam, but um, we have our session pre-recorded and it takes a little bit of the pressure off myself. So give me one second and hopefully tech will work well for us. Um, sorry, is that screen sharing? Yep. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louise, and I'll be presenting today with Cara. Um, I'd like to thank IGS for the opportunity to speak today on a topic both myself and Cara are really passionate about. We are both therapists. I'm a physiotherapist and Cara, who will be speaking later, is an occupational therapist. And we both work in frailty intervention therapy teams. Our presentation today is looking at the role of therapy in delirium management. And it's largely based on our own experiences of implementing delirium screening and preventative and management strategies. Frailty intervention therapy teams, or FIT teams, have been developed in recent years and are in many of the hospitals throughout the country. They consist of teams of health and social care professionals in Cork University Hospital, where I am based, and in Beaumont Hospital, where CARE is based. Both the FIT teams are therapy-led services based within the emergency department. The aim of the service in the FIT team is that all patients over the age of 75 years presenting to the hospital are screened for frailty in the emergency department. If they are identified as being frail, they then go on to receive a comprehensive multifactorial assessment. The main purpose of these teams and having them in the emergency department is to prevent unnecessary hospital admissions for these vulnerable older adults and link with community services where patients' medical and therapy needs can be met outside the acute hospital. So really trying to drive a home first approach. On the other side of the coin then for the patients that do require medical admission, it means that they are being screened at the front door and at the start of their hospital journey and receiving early therapy intervention and early care planning. And this has been shown to reduce bed days and improve patient outcomes. Looking at delirium in an acute setting, so research has shown that 10 to 30 percent of patients in acute hospitals will develop a delirium. And specific to the emergency department, that 75 percent of all cases are said to be overlooked. As we are all well aware, our overcrowded emergency departments have adverse effects for the older adult population. So it's no surprise that more than 12 hours in an ED department is an independent risk factor for the development of delirium. This data again just highlights the need for assessment of delirium in ED and in a preventative approach. That brings me on to the role we played and our Delirium Quality Improvement Initiative. So this began a year and a half ago and it's still ongoing and we're still trying to make improvements. So it started in 2019. Myself and Cara were tasked with setting up a new FIT service in Cork University Hospital. So it was a very small team of just the two of us, so one physio and one occupational therapist. Initially, uh, we did an audit within the emergency department, which showed that no patients were being assessed for delirium. So as part of developing this new service, we designed our own assessment tool and made the decision to include the 4AT screen in our assessment tool, which meant that each patient we saw got assessed for delirium. So this is great. It was a starting point and it got the ball rolling and it was the first step of introducing delirium screening in the emergency department. The downside to this was obviously there were a lot of patients over 65 that we didn't assess as well as patients presenting outside of our working areas and weekends. So overall, about 11% of patients over 65 were getting a delirium screen. 
Recognising that this wasn't enough, we made the next step in our quality improvement initiative, which is number three, and we collaborated with an ED consultant called Dennis, and introduced the 4AT into the ED database and did a huge education piece. With the image on the top left of the screen, so Dennis, one of our ED consultants, got these cards made up, which basically is the 4AT on the front and on the back. It's very similar to a staff ID card and it could fit in the same card holder as your staff card. So it was great that everyone could have one and have it easy to hand. The second thing we did was the picture on the right hand side is the CUH Emergency Department Assessment Booklet. And as you can see at the end of the page, we now have the 4AT included in the assessment booklet. The image then on the bottom left, this was done more recently, so it is an education board on delirium, which is located in our emergency department, and it just has information on recognising delirium, methods to prevent it. At the time, we did a very large education piece with staff in the emergency department. We gave presentations and information sessions to all the doctors. We also linked with one of our clinical nurse facilitators, Maraid. And she did a great job on education sessions with all of the nurses in the emergency department. So that brings us to number four, which was the quality improvement group. So at the same time, myself and Cara were part of a quality improvement group in the emergency department. And the aim of the group was to improve the ED experience for patients and staff. Uh, it was a multidisciplinary group. Uh, we had representatives from nursing, medicine, porters, household, admin, therapy, um, and a project myself and Cara took a lead on, which linked very well with the work that we were doing with delirium, was making the ED more dementia or delirium friendly. Using the dementia friendly design guidelines, we were able to firstly assess our ED department against their criteria for making hospitals delirium friendly. Then the QI group sat down and we designed a plan to make our ED more dementia friendly. Some things we were immediately able to do, so such as giving patients survival packs. These included packs which had toothpaste, earplugs and eye masks, again, which were very preventative measures the picture on the top right hand side shows some of the fantastic work our local knitting groups were able to do for us. So members of the QI group contacted different knitting clubs across Cork and they were able to make these fidget sleeves and also fidget blankets which we give to patients with a delirium or dementia um, and it's extremely helpful in preventing patients becoming distressed from IV lines. Originally, we had decided to make one of the bays in ED as a pilot bay and try to make it more dementia friendly. However, due to the great work um, from our ED and geriatric departments, uh, we were really lucky that they had built a six bay age attuned area in ED, which was called a GEMS unit. So which was specifically designed for older adults um, and we were able to have an input into the design in that. So, for example, the bottom two pictures are from the GEMS unit. So just showing the kind of new signs, which were again age attuned in the colour red, which is easier for patients with dementia to read and also bathroom and shower with appropriate rails. Uh, each bay has a radio and appropriate lighting as well. And then the last step, myself and Cara uh, sat on the National Working Group for Delirium and we were involved in updating the Irish Delirium Pathways. So this is the algorithm for early identification and management of delirium. I won't go through all of this as I know Niamh will be mentioning it in her talk later on. But as therapists, um, I suppose our role was inputting into the content for this, but also introducing it then in our own departments and promoting it and creating awareness. Cara will go through the specific parts that we as therapists played a role in and also give some case studies of how it worked. Thank you to Louise for the first part of the presentation. The second is going to focus on the role of therapy in delirium identification and management within the ED. Um, so my name is Cara McLaughlin. I'm a clinical specialist occupational therapist in Bowmount ED. And prior to that, I was the OT that worked with Louise in setting up the fit service in CUH. Um, I think the previous slides clearly demonstrated the need for a whole team approach in delirium detection and management, but it also highlighted the need for leaders or champions to drive change. And this is the role that myself and Louise took on in this project. 
as therapists, we feel we are best placed because in delirium detection due to our holistic approach in our role. We consider not just the person on the presentation to ED, but their ability prior to admission and how function and cognition may be impacted due to the reason for this presentation. And this is reflected in the frailty markers we address in our common screening tool. Evidence suggests that early multi-component, multi-intervention and multidisciplinary approaches provide the best management for patients with delirium. As therapists in the ED, we're in a good position to prevent delirium and start early management. This will be highlighted in additional slides with some case studies. Now we need to consider our actual input and putting guidelines such as the dementia-friendly hospital guidelines into practice. Areas we can address include orientation, oral intake, mobility and sleep. Those on this slide are simple steps that not just help to prevent delirium worsening, but also aim to stop it developing in high-risk groups. With regards to orientation, we want to make sure that people can see clocks and provide them orientation boards if appropriate. Also that we are orientating the person that is evidently delirious rather than consistently asking them where they are. Natural light is rare in the ED, but consider night and daytime if lights are on, curtains open, etc. And ensure people have their glasses and hearing aids. If you can hear or see properly, then your risk of becoming disorientated within the environment will worsen. With regards to oral intake, we want to ensure that all patients have access to water and that every encounter we have with the patient that we're offering them a drink, obviously apart from those in restrictions. Currently in the NHS, they're running a very simple but effective campaign called that But Drink First campaign. What this means is that any time you see a person, you're a patient, your first interaction with them will be to offer them a drink prior to actually um, continuing your role with them. If delirium is evident, you want to highlight to specials, HEAs, nurses that this person may need assistance to eat or drink and consider the provision of triggers, such as the use of a red tray or cups. As therapists, we understand the benefits of mobility and the risks of prolonged bed rest. In our common screening tool, we ask regarding mobility and we carry out functional assessments to assess if there's been a change or prevent deconditioning. We provide appropriate mobility aids, which we stock within the ED, and we update staff to empower them to mobilise the patient so that it's not just therapists that are um, mobilising patients. We always try to get patients out of hospital gowns, removing the patient role. It's also vital that we consider continence wear. Are they in a pad? And what is their baseline? Is it required? It, at times it is difficult to get patients in their own clothes. We need to consider other options if their own clothes are not available. So the use of slipper socks or plaster shoes if they don't have shoes, or also um, having a, an additional clothes store within the ED with spare clothes that have been donated by charity. Finally, we need to consider sleep. So the sleep-wake cycle is easily disturbed when you're thinking about admission times to ED and how long that person may have waited prior to her admission if they're waiting for an ambulance or to be assessed. We um, use other products that we already have in stock, such as earplugs and eye masks, especially when we're thinking about patients in the corridor where there is artificial light and noise throughout the day and night. And then trying to encourage people to sit out as much as they can during the day. So the following is a poster designed by Senior OT in Medell and Beaumont. It provides all the essential assessment and management pieces in delirium and can be used in rapid teaching sessions. As we mentioned previously, delirium identification and management is an ongoing PDSA cycle and education is key, not just in the ED, but throughout the acute hospital and also with our community counterparts for all staff at all levels to achieve effective change. So now we're going to have a look at two different case studies that highlight the therapy input in delirium detection and management. The first is an 81 year old gentleman who presented to ED overnight following a fall on his farm with a long lie. He was treated for an AKI. He was requested to be assessed by FIT the following morning and on presentation there is an evident hyperactive delirium with a special in situ who was quite agitated and was having evident visual hallucinations. So what was our role? So initially we identified the delirium. 
we got this man mobilised and toileted. Initially, he was assistance of three due to the visual hallucinations. Um, he actually thought that he was in a lake and was trying to step over um, parts of the water. And we orientated him. We provided um, oral intake and we flagged him to bed management so that he wasn't on a corridor for an unnecessary amount of time. We then continued our input for the next week. So we reviewed him daily, providing input with regards ADLs, PADLs, mobility and education, which is essential to staff. So they're aware that this is an acute change and what they could do to help this man. The outcome was that we went home with a new package of care within 10 days. I honestly feel that if we hadn't began our role within the first 24 hours, there would have been a much longer length of stay for this man with, uh, with worsening outcomes. Our second case study looks at a 92-year-old lady who presented to ED with a possible UTI. She had advanced dementia with excellent family support in place. When she was assessed by FIT, there was a catheter already in situ and she was becoming very distressed trying to climb out of her trolley. Um, she had presented to ED overnight and the overnight ED medics had already referred her to inpatients for admission due to confusion. Um, due to the ongoing COVID restrictions, family were unable to sit with her. So again, what was our role with this person? So initially we carried out a common screening tool where we got the background into what her baseline was like, clearly from her family. We liaised with the medics regarding the treatment of her UTI. Could, there, could her catheter be removed? Um, had the bloods been reviewed? And had a discussion taken place whether oral antibiotics would be appropriate or did she need to be admitted for IVs? We also discussed with them the benefits versus the risks of an admission. We carried out functional assessment, whose assistance with one with us in ED, her baseline was unaided with supervision. Then we liaised with her family following this assessment and we provided education on delirium. And again, we discussed the risks versus the benefits of an admission. What happens in, from an outcome point of view? A joint decision was made between medics, fish and the family that a direct discharge home from the ED was the most appropriate for this lady. And we completed an outreach visit to review her in her own familiar environment. And um, this is something that I'm taking a lead on within Beaumont, where if indicated, we will go out and see somebody in their own environment to get a formal assessment of their needs, which will be a lot more attuned to their ability rather than the ED environment. And she was able to successfully stay at home with the correct education and um, support provided by her family. Um, so that's a very uh, quick whistle stop tour of what myself and Louise have dug within CUH and it's something I'll hope to bring to my new role in Bowmount as well um, and I think it just hopefully it highlights the benefits of therapy what we can do um, not just to ourselves but to the medics as well so thanks again. Thanks very much, uh, both Cara and Louise, for a fascinating talk and a fantastic example of how continuous quality improvement can really um, uh, change care for, for patients with delirium um, and keeping the patient at the centre. And it also shows really um, how your, your service is, is integrated between the ED, the community and the acute wards. And it's really, really fantastic work. Thanks very much. Um, I, I'm actually going to talk next. I have a, a, a short talk. Um, I'm just going to screen share here first. Um, um, okay, so um, my talk is really, I, the, the whole uh, purpose of my talk is really just to make sure that Everybody's aware of these um, Irish algorithms we have now for delirium in acute care. And I'm I'm presenting this on behalf of a huge body of people, a big working group um, led by Suzanne Timmons and the National Dementia Office, um, to, who developed um, these pathways for both dementia and delirium in acute care, and they're available on the Dementia Pathways website. I'll be, I'll, I'll show you the the uh, website link will be on my slides. Um, but uh, uh, in this talk, I just intend to give a brief um, overview of the background to these algorithms, as well as a brief overview of the algorithms themselves, just to fa familiarise yourselves with them. Um, we're aware for a long time about the importance of um, 
uh, certain elements of delirium care, like risk factor assessment, screening, using multi-component interventions, both prevent and treat delirium. And uh, the most recent um, uh, up-to-date evidence-based international guidance for delirium were um, published in 2019. And we're very lucky to have Professor Alistair McLulloch, who was um, who co-chaired the, the committee on de who developed um, these guidelines. Um, but uh, these guidelines also recommend the key recommendations from these are that you know screening regularly for to, in order to detect delirium as well as identifying risks and reducing those risks and using non-pharmacological methods in order to treat delirium are key in terms of delirium care the national dementia strategy as we'll all be aware was published in 2014 but uh, in that strategy, there were five main action points in terms of uh, delivering care for dementia patients in the acute setting. And these mainly kind of focused on the um, development and implementation, as well as governance of dementia and delirium care pathways for patients in acute care that would be implemented then at a local level. Um, and also um, these action points included um, developing recommendations in terms of environmental changes to, um, to the hospitals that would um, make them more dementia friendly. Um, as a result of the National Dementia Strategy, then there were um, uh, competitions uh, funded by um, HSC and Genio, um, or, or there were grants funded by HSC and Genio um, to uh, different uh, to 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 um, three different hospitals who um, were successful in the competition to develop local acute and community pathways for, de for dementia care in the acute setting. And um, these hospitals went through um, processes to develop these pathways with stakeholder engagement. And ultimately, these projects laid the foundation for the later development of the National de Dementia and Delirium Pathways. Um, the, the delirium algorithms, um, there are two of them. There's one for the emergency department at AMU and one for the acute wards. And there have been previous versions of these algorithms developed between 2014 and 2017. The ED algorithm um, has been rolled out previously and used as part of frailty training. However, the um, delirium algorithm for acute wards, although piloted in a couple of different hospitals, hasn't been rolled out on a national basis up until um, uh, this next version has been developed. Then last year, Suzanne Timmons and the National Dementia Office called for a working group of volunteers across various dif different disciplines and specialties to develop the dementia pathways, as well as revise the delirium algorithms as part of this greater body of work to enhance um, uh, the care of patients with um, cognitive impairment in hospitals. And as I've mentioned earlier, I'm presenting this on behalf of a large group of people led by uh, Dr. Timmons and uh, both Cara and Louise, as I mentioned earlier, were involved in the development of these um, delirium algorithms. We'll also all be very much aware of the fact that um, the, Irish the second Irish National Audit for um, Dementia Care um, in Acute Hospitals um, was published in September 2020, having been conducted in 2019. And I think, you know, if, in terms of delirium, what we'll see really is that we're, um, there's, there's a big gap. We have, we have a long way to go before we are um, kind of providing the care we want to be provide, providing across our hospitals. Only a very small proportion of hospitals have screening and care policies for delirium in place um, and also care pathways um, and bundles for delirium, um, both in the ED and the, and the AMU. Um, however, many other hospitals have them in development. Um, and when we looked at the chart audit um, uh, that was published, um, only about 20% of charts had any of these patients with dementia had any delirium screening recorded, which is actually down from 2013. But there was actually um, improved recording of delirium and discharge letters from 2013 to 2019, which suggests that perhaps some of the messages filtering down about the importance of delirium documentation. But a key recommendation from INAC2 was that all hospitals should implement these nationally agreed algorithms for delirium in the ED, AMU, and on the acute ward. And as I've mentioned, these are all available on the Dementia Pathways website. And just um, to show you what they look like, um, as I've mentioned, there's an EDAMU delirium algorithm. This is designed to be used in conjunction with a combined dementia delirium pathway and care bundle. 
There's also an acute ward delirium algorithm. There's an integrated care pathway for known dementia, um, which is uh, like we call it the overarching pathway for um, that kind of straddles community and um, acute care. Um, and this is for patients with known dementia and acute, um, uh, presenting acutely or in potential crisis. And then um, also in the acute setting, we have a dementia integrated care pathway and a diagnostic pathway for sus suspected dementia in patients who don't have a, an un a known diagnosis. But in today's talk, I'm going to concentrate on the two delirium algorithms. And first and foremost, I suppose, just to, meant to talk about this, you've seen this already, um, Louise showed it in her slides. Um, this is the, the delirium algorithm for the ED and AMU. And just to orientate you, it, firstly, it, the left-hand side of, the, of, the, of this document is the algorithm. The right-hand side are supporting tools to help you apply the algorithm. It is very busy. We're aware of that. Um, however, when it comes to delirium, it's very difficult to distill down the information and, and not lose, um, I suppose, the, the, the key messages that we're trying to, um, to, to get through. And additionally, this is an educational document. We're hoping that people will learn from using it, um, as well as a, um, a document with kind of uh, memory aids for the different types of strategies we need to use in order to uh, improve delirium care. It is color coded and we see at the very top we have green. And you'll notice that we recommend that all older adults over the age of 65 or 65 or older presenting to the ED and AMU are screened for delirium using the 4AT at the first available contact that is possible. Um, uh, some hospitals will be able to do it at triage, others will be able to do it slightly after triage. However, we're, we're recommending it wherever it's the earliest point possible. Um, the, the age cutoff of 65 years was a little bit of a controversial issue. However, we wanted it to be consistent with nursing quality care metrics, which recommends delirium screening in, um, in older adults. So we just wanted to all be singing off the same hymn sheet. The the it prompts us to do the 4AT and um, that links us to this um, uh, tool over here. So the 4AT is now the most widely recommended tool in these islands and across um, other countries too. Um, and uh, developed by uh, Alistair McLulloch and team. And ultimately, depending on the result of the 4AT, you'll either have a suspected delirium with a result of a 4AT of four or more. And this goes down the yellow side of the algorithm where it's flagged that some medical emergency and a cascade of events should happen, including assessing for potential causes using the pinch me algorithm. If a patient um, scores between zero to three, what's really important that I mention here is that to arrive at that score, you must have gotten collateral history for it to be um, uh, really a score of zero to three. Um, patients who score one to three are highly likely to have, are, you know, a, a possibility of uh, underlying cognitive um, impairment or perhaps undiagnosed dementia. And we um, advise you then to link in with the care bundle, on, which is designed to be used with this um, algorithm uh, on, on the, um, for, for de delirium and dementia care for, uh, in patients with cognitive um, vulnerability. This blue box also recognizes that although a patient may have a 4AT score of zero to three now, they may be at risk of delirium and it prompts you to look at this um, uh, risk factor box over here on the right side of the algorithm um, and, and to recognize that this person um, may develop delirium at a later point. We, d we advise strategies for delirium prevention and management in the EDAMU, which are non-pharmacological and addressing risk factors as well as potentially avoiding potentiating iatrogenic factors. And we do give some advice on what medications can be used, but we caution against the use of medications unless a patient really requires them for being so distressed or, or agitated that they're, a threat to, that they're considered a threat to themselves or others. The delirium in general hospital wards is designed as a next steps document, building on the, the algorithm in the ED and also consistent with the algorithms from the ED. So you'll notice some similar elements. The blue box identifying the patient at risk is the same. So is the strategies for delirium prevention and management, as is the, ass the assessment of potential causes using the mnemonic pinch me. We have the same color coding, green for screening, and um, but we you know, and 
you know, we're hoping that this will be following on from a patient who will have had a 4AT score in the ED or AMU. However, if they haven't had one, we recommend completing a 4AT on admission to the ward for all patients at risk of delirium. And if they do have delirium, again, it's down the yellow side of the algorithm with some extra advice on um, how to reassess and monitor for resolution or persistence. Um, and some extra tips in caring for patients with delirium on a, um, on a day to day basis for ward staff. If a patient screens negative and they have risk factors for delirium, which um, in the vast majority of these ca cases um, will, will do, we recommend daily screening. In the ED, we recommend the 4AT um, outright. However, for daily screening, you know, we recognize that the challenges certainly will be in terms of implementation at a local base, a local level. So we recommend using whatever is the most feasible tool that you can use in your hospital setting to deliver daily and routine and consistent delirium screening. Implementation is obviously the elephant in the room. It's been a key issue in delirium care for several decades. Um, one of the main INED2 recommendations is that um, locally every hospital would have a dementia QI group, um, which would um, encompass um, also de uh, improving delirium care. Um, but I'd also, and, and Alistair is, is going to talk about this given his vast experience in this area. Um, but um, I'd also like to just mention a, this great article by Emma Vardy and Rebecca Thompson that was published earlier this year. Um, that summarizes the literature on quality improvement and delirium and also gives some very, very helpful um, strategies for how one might um, <coughs> start quality improvement processes uh, uh, in, in your own hospital. Paul is going to talk about challenges within the COVID pandemic and caring for patients with delirium, but I just wanted to mention it as it is also a major issue in terms of implementation of these strategies, um, but also to recognize that delirium is very much <clears throat> a presenting feature of COVID-19, although often under-recognized in the literature, um, although um, thankfully increasingly um, being reported on. And often patients who present with, uh, with COVID-19 and delirium often present without typical features, which is concerning. But there are other issues that I'm sure Paul will, will also be addressing in terms of um, you know, the challenges in managing patients within the pandemic. I just wanted to also mention though that David Marr, um, a psychiatrist and also delirium researcher and expert, um, from University of Limerick has published this article um, in the Irish uh, uh, jur Journal of Psychological Medicine this year, um, uh, uh, outlining some key management tips for suspected delirium in patients with COVID-19, and again, highlighting the non-pharmacological strategies that can be employed um, as low-hanging fruit, and that there is other um, uh, strategies that can certainly be employed too, but these can definitely be employed um, without major issues in terms of infection prevention and control. Um, once again, just wanted to um, uh, highlight the Dementia Pathways um, website and thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, we're all going to take questions at the end, um, so um, I just want to uh, thank everybody um, for listening to this talk and um, I'll just stop screen sharing now. And next I'm going to... Um, uh, um, introduce Paul McElwain, who I know for a long time, since our time in uh, UCD Medical School. He's currently a consultant um, physician in geriatric medicine at Tally University Hospital and um, senior clinical senior lecturer in the Department of Medical Gerontology at Trinity College Dublin. He has recently received his medical doctorate, which focused on um, the uh, National Audit of Acute and Rehabilitation Services and Stroke in Ireland uh, between 2015 and 2016. He's got research interests that include comp comprehensive geriatric assessment um, with particularly its impact on falls and prevention and neurovascular health. So Paul, thank you very, very much for um, speaking to us today on overcoming challenges in delirium care throughout um, the, this pandemic that we find ourselves in. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Just a moment. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see and hear me. Um, so yes, yeah, so firstly, thank you to our president, uh, Professor Kenny, uh, Dermot and Dan, our moderators, and me for the opportunity uh, from the RGS uh, to speak on a topic which increasingly, I think, is being recognized by non-gerontological disciplines as an essential part of the assessment, the acute assessment of an older person. I'm not going to provide a comprehensive review of managing delirium care in COVID. Rather, I'll just highlight a few particular areas and hopefully that will have 
you know, some relevance to everyone and maybe inform the discussion. Um, so the main takeaway from my presentation is perhaps just to provide a stimulus for reflection um, on the challenges we've, we've all faced during these times. Um, I'll begin with a little bit of context from my own experience in Tala, um, and then maybe hone in on a few specific areas, um, and this hopefully will, will stimulate some debate. Um, so Tala is, you know, um, nearly a 500 bed acute, uh, uh, acute hospital for, for adults as well as we have a pediatric section which we sort of overtook nearly during the COVID uh, period. But we have, you know, over 60,000 presentations in the emergency department every year. Um, of those, um, you know, 5, 000, over 5,000 of those are 75, people 75 and older. And I suppose a little bit like similar to as Cara and Louise had mentioned, our hospital were very much supportive of trying to deliver age attuned care early in the patient journey. And so we developed our own Jedi team, and as my colleague, Dr. Hayden, um, who, uh, who leads out on that. And really that was, you know, had a number of measures, but one of the things that it could focus on was screening for delirium earlier uh, with, the, with the hope that that would uh, improve um, outcomes such as length of stay, reduce mortality and morbidity. So you can see if, if you take that number of 5,400 uh, over 75 year olds in 2019, this team, even though they're not 24 seven, still managed to capture almost 43% of the people with, uh, with, a, a, with a, an assessment. And of those, I would say expected sort of numbers of about one in five um, patients um, were coming up with evidence of delirium. Um, I guess this concept of multi-professional uh, approach is sort of in synergy with the clinical paradigm we present uh, for patient-centered care through the support structures of comprehensive geriatric assessment. And I guess we pride ourselves in the personal care and attention that uh, gerontological disciplines provide to patients. And I guess at the end, at the turn of the year, we learned of a novel virus which was extremely contagious and appeared to be particularly dangerous towards the more vulnerable in society. And so the paradigm of cha care changed and patients were now met on arrival to emergency departments with an image of PPE uh, for their own safety. But I think we all felt uh, the fear that these patients had. And then from an early stage, it was clear that older people were not necessarily presenting with typical symptoms and that delirium, as with other conditions with delirium, uh, was the only clear finding or a, a fairly strong feature of the, the presentation. So it made assessing um, and managing delirium even more complex with COVID. And we're largely facing um, this challenge in the dark. Um, there was huge gaps in knowledge with regards to assessments, treatments, and outcomes. So I think there was um, these clear concerns, certainly from the gerontological disciplines was there, um, and how that pre-existing gap, which people have already spoken about in sort of appreciation of delirium was being exaggerated in, in COVID. Um, there was a very good editorial early on from uh, Shana Hanlon and Sharon Inure, um, which really reflected like the most vulnerable group really weren't being represented in the clinical assessments. And then even in the last week, uh, a paper from MassGen in, in the US um, really fur further sort of honing in on the fact that, you know, upwards of, um, I think it was about 16% of the patients, delirium was the only presenting feature in COVID. And then a further third of those patients didn't have the classic symptoms of say fever and shortness of breath. So the three challenges I'm just gonna make brief reference to, um, and hopefully this is sort of ring true with people. Um, and this is accepting that delirium is under, an underrecognized clinical entity anyway. Um, for collateral input, um, so again, probably preaching to the converses, uh, collateral history is an essential element in assessing people with cognitive issues. Um, and there's a noticeable gap in the literature on this topic. It's noteworthy actually that Irish researchers are, are quite to the fore in this. And I should mention my own colleague, Professor O'Neill here in Tala, uh, along with uh, our colleague James uh, Robert Briggs, and a very good paper about this a few years back. Um, and if you look at uh, the guidance Collateral history is an expected standard when you're assessing people with dementia, uh, and it should be a record of the collateral history. Um, 
apologies this uh, helicopter arriving, but there's a lot to happen. Um, so, and also if we look at the 4AT, um, this tool that we, a lot of us are now using to screen for delirium, um, requires some collateral history at the front door. Um, and I guess if you have no collateral, you don't really have a score. So that made it a challenge. And then I suppose the supply of knowledge uh, was decimated due to um, social isolation, restrictions in visiting, the so-called so cocooning leading to an artificial separation from others. Um, and that was really negating some of the validity of the information you were getting because patients weren't being seen very regularly. So how do you assess change? And I think this newspaper article as well just sort of captures that wave of it where, you know, allowing older people out to exercise. It was a very restricted period. And probably the other two main features of the first wave, which was baking sourdough bread and watching normal people, neither of which I embrace, I have to say. Um, but we became quite reliant on an old familiar, which was the telephone. Um, you know, we were hoping that families had spoken with uh, the patients presenting, that they had some general sense of their medical history and their medication. And that we could actually communicate some of the, the risk that this could get worse quite quickly and that, you know, and this was often done in the middle of the night uh, and patients may have not been seen for some day. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap of guilt and concern there with families. Um, so then the other challenge, I think, which is pretty obvious um, is environmental restrictions and um, highly contagious nature of COVID meant that we were extremely, had to be extremely vigilant uh, and restricted in our patient contact. And this impact was not just restricted to COVID patients, but just clearly all patients, because we had a obviously a, a clear suspicion that those high uh, carriage rates between staff. So with every interaction we were asking ourselves, do I absolutely need to go into this room? And if I'm in that room, is there other things I should be performing while I'm there? And it just made the, 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 the episode of care more challenging. And if you just even compare between um, usual practice and now how COVID has impacted. Normally someone, if we identify either vulnerable for delirium or has delirium, we would keep them on close observation. Certainly our single rooms in the general ward have no windows and uh, to actually observe the patient directly, you need to open the door to see them. Regular reorientation again was a challenge. One-to-one -one care, we were sure of the level of risk and outside of the, the controlled ICU setting, we were putting staff, and I, I certainly I think a lot of people would know staff members who ended up very sick with this condition. And then you look at medication, which along the treatment algorithm is way down there, but you then have this extra complicator of patients who are mobile with a highly contagious condition and the balance of risk to others was, was coming to the fore. And this was all in the background as well of, at the time, a concern that did we have enough PPE to go around? So uh, it made it extremely challenging. The third area, just to flag as well, was rehabilitation. Um, so, I mean, some specialist groups very proactively were suggesting that, you know, um, it was clear that people with COVID would need sort of intensive or would need some level of rehabilitation, probably at the bedside up until time of discharge. Um, but we had a large group of people who didn't necessarily have COVID, but still had massive general rehabilitation needs and all the principles of social distancing weren't conducive with care. Um, and this was putting a lot of extra time and strain on services. And if it was like our institution um, who has an external unit for rehabilitation, flow literally just stopped. There was no, no flow between the services. So this was a big problem. And then if you think about just more fundamentally, some of the things that we've been trying to achieve in the recent past around, you know, the concept of, you know, is your patient fit to sit? Do they need to be sort of sitting around at MPJ paralysis? We are now sort of saying, no, you need to restrict your movement. There is a serious contagious illness out there. So how did we overcome these challenges? And again, um, if there was any positive from COVID, and there is very few, um, it's how quickly we adapted to what new work practices. Um, and this is not to blindly say we accepted all new things and challenge, but it was just reduces the bar for obstruction. And we had a concept of sort of CGA in the background. Um, I think we did as best we could is really my summary of it. So mobile and connected technologies were seen as a potential solution. And to a degree that 
they did help, not as a substitute for providing clinical equipoise, but at least providing some options to maintain some semblance of personal care to patients. Um, this is just a quick example of one of the technologies we utilize. This is our clinical director um, who was observing a dialysis patient. So the, the nurse is wearing a, a, an eye headset. So he can have a full interaction. He can do a full round in the dialysis unit, but minimizing the actual contact. So the patient still can see the, uh, the person, hear the person. And it does, it's not a substitute, but at least it, it provides care. And then some of the things, I suppose, where we centered on connectedness um, being maintained and using novel ideas like writing letters um, and care packages, and also obviously using the technologies to see one another. And it is social connectivity, you know, we felt would help people and specifically people with cognitive, cognitive issues. And then notwithstanding, I generally have a pragmatic approach to um, working in hospitals. So try and keep the plan simple and um, clarity in the instructions you give um, and a commitment to apply the care that you, you, you wish to, not as a burden to the team, but actually because you know it's good for the patients. Um, and I think similarly, uh, it was flagged earlier in Dr. O'Hanlon's editorial uh, programs such as the Hospital Elder Life Program. It's, it's really not uh, very unachievable work here, even in the face of COVID. Um, it just shows that you just need patience and kindness and a little bit of time to look after these people. Um, so delirium care should involve a concerted effort to, I suppose, monitor and intervene when necessary in some of these um, areas. So people should be made sure that their cardiovascular neurological status is stable, continence is addressed, they get an opportunity to be mobile, they sleep well, eat well, have stress reducing measures in place, stay connected and have their pain managed. So really I'm finishing on the massive bombshell that uh, COVID has only further strengthened the resolve that we need strongly support, supported expert gerontological care. Um, we needed it before COVID and we, we need it now. So Thanks very much, Paul. That's a fantastic talk, um, highlighting major issues uh, with delirium care, particularly through the, the, the pandemic. And, innovative ways that your hospital and other um, uh, centres have used to try to um, address these challenges. Um, so thanks very much, Paul, for that. Um, okay, so on to our last and our keynote speaker, um, Professor Alistair Malkloluk, who is um, Professor of Geriatric Medicine at University of Edinburgh um, since 2009. He is truly a world expert in delirium. Um, and his research inter interests really do span the entire spectrum from the neurobiology of delirium right through to clinical um, management and, uh, and, and translation of uh, delirium research into practice. Um, he is the main author of the 4AT, which I've mentioned earlier, he, but this is only one of the things that he has done, um, uh, but uh, obviously has been mentioned many times today. Um, he co-founded the European Delirium Association and also um, one of the founder of the Scottish Delirium Association. Um, he, <clears throat> he also, as I mentioned earlier, was um, a key contributor being co-chair of the committee that developed the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network guidance for on delirium in 2019. And on top of all of that, he's still working very much clinically um, in orthogeriatrics and acute geriatric medicine. So um, very, very pleased to have um, Professor McLulloch uh, speak today on um, developing, implementing and sustaining improvements in delirium care. Thank you. I think my um, presentation has been recorded and I'll be doing some be available for Q&A after that. Okay, so May, can you um, play that for us, please, or Dan? Uh, Alistair, you, do you want me to play the recording from here? You do? Yeah, I, I, I have it here as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Here. I had oh, yeah. Play it, yeah.
Okay, sorry, I'm just going to bring this up now. Alistair, I think your sound isn't playing yeah. there, Alistair. Yeah. Alistair, the sound isn't playing on that. The not. No. Do you I'm want sorry. me to see if, Alistair, do you want me to see if I can launch it for you here? Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry, that's... May I, I have it here and I might have a more stable connection than yeah, you. Do. Let's do it. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'll just do it now. To this webinar. I'm going to use the next 20 minutes or so to go through some reflections on how we can improve delirium care, focusing as much as possible on clinical. Sorry, Dan, you're going to need to your phone again. Sorry, am I sharing or is May sharing? Moment. Sorry about this. Uh, Today's connection is very bad. Yeah, it was either I, I, Alistair or you, Dan. It wasn't I'll me. I'll share. I'll share right now. Okay. Thank okay, you. Brilliant. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Neve and the Irish Gerontological Society for inviting me to contribute to this webinar. I'm going to use the next 20 minutes or so to go through some reflections on how we can improve delirium care, focusing as much as possible on clinical practice rather than studies that might not make it into clinical practice. And I'll be drawing on from what evidence there is, as well as from some of my own experience. So I'd like now just to very briefly consider where we are in providing delirium care. So I think if we're honest, outside of some pockets of good practice, if you look at these different aspects of delirium care, we're not doing very well just now, and plenty of evidence for that is out there. So how have we come to the point in well into the 21st century with all the knowledge we have about healthcare and the improved infrastructure, why are we still so bad at delirium care in general? Well, there are many different possible reasons and some of these are listed on this slide. I'm sure that there is truth in all of these and you can find through looking at survey results and so on that people do have a range of beliefs about delirium and about cognition, about aging, about ownership of the condition and so on. And all of that impacts on our ability to provide consistent care for people with delirium. I think a reasonable conclusion, if you look at the research in delirium over the last few decades and attempts to improve care, 
especially in the last 10 or 20 years when there's been much more of a movement towards this, is the sheer complexity of the challenge. And the conclusion from all of that is that single solutions to improve this or that aspect of the lung care doesn't work usually, and you need multiple elements. So to achieve good performance and good outcomes, we need to look at a lot of different ingredients. So these are what I think are the key ingredients needed if you are going to improve the learning care at a whole systems level. And I'm highlighting education there in green and showing the different aspects of education. This has been a key discovery as I'll come on to later. We need to combine that with effective processes, quality improvement methods, institutional knowledge and support, and also standards combined with audit. So I'd like now to go through different scenarios briefly in the care process of delirium, which help to highlight the kinds of challenges we need to meet. So scenario one is just one of detection in the emergency department with an older man arriving. And it's important for us to know if he has delirium or not. So we need to think about how we can solve that problem. This is another kind of scenario where we have somebody who's arrived without delirium, but they are at high risk of developing this during their stay what processes might we have to know if somebody is developing delirium on our wards? A similar kind of problem is in picking up delirium that's arisen after surgery, and this might be done through a regular once or twice a day monitoring process, or it might be done through a tool that's always done in, a, in this particularly high risk period. Most delirium that we look after is actually present on admission with a smaller number of cases arising post admission. So clearly one of the major challenges is delirium treatment. What we do when somebody comes in with delirium, what process should we use to optimize delirium treatment? And as I said earlier, one of the most studied and best evidence aspects of delirium care is in prevention of delirium or reduction of the risk of delirium. And we know from various risk scores that certain patients are at high risk. So what should we do to try and reduce that risk? So in terms of thinking about the clinical challenges, I think you can boil it down to three basic processes that we need to have solutions for. I'd now like to consider detection in clinical practice. And I recently wrote a blog in which I tried to find and list all the delirium detection tools that had ever been written. And actually I found that there were 60. So quite bewildering to look at and work at what they're all supposed to do. However, in clinical practice, I think you can boil it down to two basic processes. The first is a tool that you would use episodically, for example, at the front door if you want to know if somebody has delirium or not. And the second is a monitoring tool that you would use in, for example, a geriatrics ward to look for delirium as it arises, incident delirium. In the ICU, the two main tools that are used are combine those two rules. So, Episodic tools might include the 4AT or the confusion assessment method. They generally take a little bit longer and they should have a balance of sensitivity and specificity. Monitoring tools, and there's quite a long list of these, are not going to work if they're too long because nurses have to do them frequently and also repeated cognitive testing isn't really going to work. So these tend to be ones that are done through observation alone. And mean, this means that the patients can stand having 
them done repeatedly. So just to quickly highlight one proposed solution that the Royal College of Physicians of London proposed, and this is to use the National Early Warning Score or News version two, which has confusion, as you can see there. So this is done at least once a day and often four times a day. And those staff members doing the observations are asked to note if the person has new confusion or if they're drowsy. And to help clarify how this process works, the Royal College suggested that something called the single question in delirium, which is has the amazing acronym SQUID. And just simply, the nurses are asked to answer the question, is your patient more confused or drowsy than normal? And if the answer is yes, then they're asked to move on to do a 4AT. I'd now like to turn to treatment. And this slide tries to capture what I see as the amazing variability in recommendations given for delirium treatment. These can range from providing orientation to adequate food intake to scanning the bladder for urinary retention and so on. And I think it can leave practitioners quite bewildered as to what delirium treatment really involves. And often it just seems to boil down to looking for any sign of an infection, often a UTI, and treating that to not doing much else. So in my own practice, I've been trying to develop a structure to this, and this is called Delirium 8. I'm not going to go through it just now, but it just tries to go through different aspects of delirium care. It builds a little bit on the time bundle that was used or is used quite widely in Scotland, but has other aspects such as prompting practitioners, for example, to communicate with patients and carers and later on to consider dementia um, because it's so common in people with delirium. The final process aspect that I'd like to consider is prevention. And I'm sure most of those listening today will know that delirium prevention is well evidenced and urged in many guidelines. And this is something which, despite its prominence in review articles and lectures and so on, hasn't actually had much of a um, quality improvement approach to, although there are many studies supporting this. So now that I've considered the processes that we need to have set up to support good delirium care, I'd like now to turn to other aspects that sit around the processes to help them work effectively. And key amongst any of these is, of course, education. This remains, I would say, the most important priority in delirium care. Sadly, we know from lots of surveys and freedom of information based studies that the coverage of delirium in undergraduate and postgraduate education is very poor. Another very important discovery is that the methods of education, what we teach to people and how we teach it actually make a big difference. So one of the most important studies in the field, <clears throat> not just in education, but I think in the whole field of delirium is by Andy Tudorchuk, who is a psychiatrist who specializes in medical education. And this study really changed the game because it showed that it wasn't just a lack of technical knowledge, but it was staff attitudes, um, a sense of not having ownership of delirium and so on. And these all contributed a lot to poor care. And that's been replicated in a few other studies in different ways since. So as part of his educational efforts, Andy Teodorczyk recorded this video. That's him there speaking to a man who'd had a very distressing experience of delirium. And this video has been viewed thousands of times and it's proven to be very effective in engaging audiences who 
are often surprised by how distressing delirium can be, and it gives them a real interest in doing better with delirium care. Andy Turrishik and other colleagues recently produced this important systematic review, which looked at all the evidence and found that not only did education improve knowledge and attitudes, but may actually directly improve care. So it's well worth having a look at this. I'd like now to talk about institutional support. And this is something that I witnessed and heard about many times is that having the backing of hospital management to provide resource, to provide visibility, to bring in other people from the organization to help can make an enormous difference. One of the interesting things about delirium is though that not only do healthcare staff often not know all that much about it, but also that's true of managers. And they're even more remote, you know, from clinical practice than and knowledge of delirium than some clinicians. So educating them about what delirium is and how they can help is also very effective. And we've used this fact sheet um, to great effect with many different managers. Another key ingredient is setting standards. This is the cover of the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network guidelines on delirium that was published in March. And I was co-chair of the group that did this. It was a three-year process. And I was really impressed by the robustness of the process with the government having scientists and other people to support it and make sure that the guideline was strong, well-written, supported by evidence and so on. But also the way that once it was published that the government, through the various health boards in Scotland, enforced the standards from SIGN through compelling health boards to set up groups that would monitor the response to the SIGN guidelines. So I'm not sure what the position is in Ireland with respect to mandating certain standards, but I think this is actually an important aspect because without this, there are many other standards which are getting attention. And if delirium care is particularly in need of improvement, it's reasonable that we insist that standards are set and adhered to. Now I'd like to move on to some examples of implementation. This is a slide from Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, where they were attempting to improve delirium care. And one of the first things they did was to embed the 4ET in EPIC, their EHR, and attempt to get people to fill this in instead of having no process at all for detection. And the 4ET has become, I hope, a useful tool in some settings <clears throat> in the UK, the 40 is mandated in all hip fracture patients, and this is audited. So the completion rates are very high. And pleasingly, the rates of positive scores at 25% are kind of along the lines of what you'd expect their, them to be. So not only is it being completed, but it's also apparently detecting appropriate levels of delirium. Another example in Houston, Texas, where again, it's been implemented with good rates of completion and positive um, scores. But these are kind of isolated examples. And in fact, the, the field is really lacking in this kind of hard implementation data. One of the most impressive recent studies looking at quality improvement in delirium was by Emma Vardy, and this is published in Age and Aging. And the aim of this project was to improve delirium detection in the emergency department. They used formal quality improvement methods with plan, do, study, act cycles in different domains, technology, training, education, and leadership. 
the baseline position was that the 4AT had appeared in the paper pro forma for the ED, but it was hardly ever completed, I think 3%. Uh, partly because the form <clears throat> was inaccessible and not really seen, but also there had been very little promotion or education around delirium. So around that time, they managed to secure funding from the NHS to introduce a new computer-based system to try and improve delirium treatment, sorry, delirium detection. And the 4ET was introduced into the EHR but this was supported by a lot of other activity, training, adverts, education. There was a monthly delirium champion appointed. And the main measure of the study was 4AT completion in, in the emergency department. So this graph shows the large increases in 4AT completion from 3 to 43% and the different interventions that were introduced to make this happen. And this is ongoing work, so hopefully there will be further increases to be reported soon. In Edinburgh, we introduced the 4AT into our electronic health record in 2016. And although there hasn't been perhaps the same level of specific project based set of activities as per the Emma Vardy study, there has been a, a lot of delirium education around for quite a lot of time. And this recent study, which we haven't published yet, shows reasonably good 4AT completion rates at the front door in medical admissions of more than 70% and more than 75% in older patients. And again, with, I think, encouraging levels of positive scores of 17%, so it's probably about right. I'd now like to turn to this large American quality improvement study that was recently published. This covered an enormous amount of work over a period of five years. They used a quality improvement approach with these process measures and with a number of outcomes as listed there. The number of patients involved was very large and they used an open age limit, so the mean age was 60 with 41% being over 65. They used a case definition of delirium based on ICD coding and also the use of sitters or restraints, which is something that we don't see very much of in Europe, but which is quite common in the States. And only 5.1% were classed. They actually measured the rates of delirium in a subset and found them to, the rate to be around 17%. So they were only detecting around a third of that with their study case definition. They also used the CAN, the confusion assessment method, and found it to be very insensitive with only 3.3% having positive CAM scores. Um, notably, if you consider those patients who had the study definition of delirium positive, only 28% were CAM positive. This is important because the CAM score was used as the trigger for implementing the delirium order set, which is the treatment process that they had. And even in those people who were CAM positive, they only managed to get a minority undergoing the delirium order set. On the other hand, they were very good at delirium risk screening, which was a, an EMR based pop-up window where they had to tick various boxes to rate the risk of delirium. So the study did have some positive results with a reduction of delirium in the patients who were classed as high risk, those, those were people who apparently didn't have delirium, and some other positive effects in the small number of people that they classed as having delirium. But overall, I think Although the positive results are not without significance, some other lessons can be learned from this study. One of them is that, of course, that their method for picking up delirium to then enable their delirium order set didn't work. And I think we probably should have seen this 
and changed it to a different method at an early stage. They did show that risk screening could be implemented using an EHR, and I think that's an important finding given that we know that delirium can be prevented. They didn't really speak about why the order set wasn't used very much. I think it could be a general lack of awareness in the physician body. Um, but overall, I think a study that has got some positive findings with respect to delirium, but also in the conduct of this kind of study. And I'll just conclude with some thoughts on sustaining improvements. Improvements in delirium care often arise from the efforts of champions who have spotted the problem and worked hard to improve it. But unfortunately, it has been observed sometimes that if you're too reliant on the efforts of these people, that the improvements can melt away. So it's important to have systems in place that sustain this. Leadership at all levels, but I think in particular from the top, is really important to maintain the profile of efforts to improve delirium care. Making sure that education is built in for staff coming in, for ongoing staff, that's really important so that everyone's on the same page. Audits, of course, are really important. Measuring yourselves against the standards, a bit different from quality improvement, but setting standards and trying to reach them and being honest about failures is really important, I think. As is feedback loops to staff, this can be really effective, saying that our overall delirium rates are this, and this is what we're expecting or we're beginning to drop, and let's try and do better can really help. And it's also important to reward people who work hard to show that if there are improvements in delirium care, that really matters for the patients and that this should be acknowledged. Just to put the slide up again to emphasize the concept that for improvements in delirium care, we need to think about lots of different elements, ingredients that kind of all need to be working for it to work. Um, without one or two of these there, then it's much harder to make sustained improvement. And I sometimes like to think about a future where we've achieved sustained improvements and what would that look like? Well, it could look like we've detected all the delirium as it comes in and as it arises, that we have a high quality approach to delirium treatment that's standardized and has less variability than what we see. This is more speculative, you know, but if we achieve good general care through something like delirium, maybe there will be new treatments, perhaps drug treatments that can help protect the brain. But I think for us to be ready for those kinds of treatments, we need to provide good general care as a platform for that. And again, with respect to delirium prevention, although we now know that avoiding atrogenic harm and so on can help prevent delirium, it'd really be great to see this just being robustly built in. So I'll leave it there and thanks very much for your attention and I'm open to questions now. Thanks a million, Alistair. That was fantastic um, uh, summary of all your um, knowledge and expertise on how to improve delirium care um, and a lot of food for thought, um, particularly when we're trying to implement our own um, national pathways in algorithms for both dementia and delirium care. Um, okay, so I, I think Dan might have a couple of questions um, for for the, the panel. Uh, thanks, Niamh. Uh, and thanks, Alistair, again for, for that excellent talk. So um, I might address the first one to Alistair, if that's OK. Um, you've touched on the uh, multifactorial barriers to education during your talk. And yeah. there was a, a question submitted by a consultant psychiatrist in Dublin exact, asking that this exact issue as to the, why is it so difficult from a practical perspective? Or do you have any practical uh, insights as to why it's so difficult to maintain the knowledge base on, on delirium in hospitals? 
Yes, I mean, I've, I've hit that barrier many times. I've, you know, spent years of my life giving bullet point type lectures, you know, <clears throat> running around. And Andy Tudor changed my life really by, by that video and by showing us that the emotional side was so important. So I just keep it simple and just say, use the, the stories, get carers to talk to you about it, get people who've been through delirium, get them to come to your lectures, get them, you know, put up um, slides of people's um, descriptions of what it's like to have, because people in healthcare are usually quite nice. They want to do a good job, but yeah. but they just don't know how horrible it is to have delirium or how bad it is for families. So I think most education should start with that and then you build the technical stuff around it. Thanks, that's, a, that's very practical uh, and helpful. Um, Niamh, I might address initially the first, the next question to you, which is more a conversational topic that has been submitted by quite a few people, uh, Lorraine Kind, for example, in the matter, around the barriers to implementation of the delirium pathways. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think when it comes to implementing anything like this, um, really, you know, I think what we should be focusing on is not trying to eat the elephant in one go, but taking it in small chunks, starting with pilot projects in particular patient cohorts, for example. And, um, and also, like, I mean, Alistair alluded to this, like the importance of involving a village, really, in, in um, improving delirium care. And it starts from, you know, it, it actually doesn't just start in the hospital. It starts with society and trying to change attitudes towards cognitive impairment and understanding the importance that, that delirium is normal, acute cognitive impairment is normal. So all of these kind of factors. Um, but it, and Alistair also alluded to the fact that it is incredibly important to get management on board. And if we do educate our, our hospital managers as to, I suppose, what delirium is, but not only that, but the incredible um, human costs, the societal costs, and the economic costs to our healthcare sector, um, you know, the, that is something they listen to. Um, but you know, and, but we do need to continue to beat the drum and 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 try and get everyone on board. But I think starting small and getting small wins gets people's confidence up, picking a particularly um, at-risk cohort and, and doing well with that cohort and showing how that can be then extrapolated to other groups, I think, I think is where we can start. Thanks, Stephen. Paul, maybe you might like to comment on some of the specifics obstacles you've um, encountered in trying to implement the delirium care bundles in Pella. Yeah, I, I guess it would be I could draw from Alistair's comments and these comments. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of competing interests. Like we have delirium, we're talking about delirium, but tomorrow I could be talking about hip fracture pathways, and the next day, you know, acute stroke. And you got to be sensitive to the staff in the emergency departments at the moment. That they're, you know, they seem to be the focal point of a lot of things, and you're trying to constantly take from them. So. I suppose, as it was mentioned, you know, they, they have to make it feel worthwhile and there's some reward in actually putting all these pathways in. And um, I think, for instance, Cara and Louise's experience in Cork was very positive. They had a, an ED physician who literally, you know, went running with it from the start, which is usually helpful. Um, but that would be my main thing. And I, at the last point, just about the champions thing, it is important to have champions. But I, I would really echo Alistair's thing that it's, it's a fragile system to build things on um, where you've got one person who's required to drive things. This is why I think a lot of times things slip because you just can't, you can't maintain it professionally as well. It, you know, you'll burn out if this is all, you know, it's all on you. So that would be my main point. Um, and then finally to, to Alistair then again, I mean, uh, would you like to give us some insight into how you have managed to achieve um, a, a mandated standards of care for delirium within Scotland? Yes, well, um, it's Scotland's like Ireland. It's a relatively small country with quite a nimble leadership, you know. And I think you know many of us just have good relationships with people, you know, in positions of power who to direct policy. So you can knock on the door and say, "Listen, delirium is a massive thing. It's bad for human beings who've got it and their families, but it's also costing us loads of money. We could do a lot better." And they were persuaded, so that's why that's that's the process of the guide of the standards was set up, and that's just a well worked out process. Um, and I'm uh, chair of the, the hip fracture audit in Scotland, and you know it's it's uh, the letters go. I see the letters; they go out to the health board, and they say you're three standard deviations away from this. You need to do better, you know, because because it's very important for, you, for old people to get good hip fracture care. So I, I mean, as somebody who used to, who was most of a sort of ground up kind of guy, I've really learned that actually the whole spectrum has to be involved and standards are very important and 
and, and ho people who run hospitals listen to that because their jobs are on the line. And I don't want to be to sound like a right winger when I say that, but you know, it's actually, the stakes are high, aren't they, for these frail old people? And I think it's reasonable for us to insist on good standards, you know, and, 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 and to, to get, find some way of making it happen instead of, you know, shouting from the sidelines, hey, do better, you know, which is what I did for about 10 years. And then I, I learned lots of other ways of getting to where I wanted to get to. Um, I think there's also been a cohort effect, like there's just more delirium around in people's minds. You know, there's a few, the UK and I think Ireland too, you know, we're probably among the world's leading countries for awareness of delirium. We've got a long way to go, but I think it's much better than it was 10 years ago. You know, so that's also helped, you know, that people are using the word much more and so on. So, but yeah, I think getting, you know, speaking to politicians, getting the profile up, using those videos, using the stories more than the figures, the figures as well. Um, you know, and just saying that everyone will win if we do a better job of this. Thank you. And then last quick question for, for the multiple trainees on, um, invariably this question comes through each time. So obviously we know the meta-analysis largely are negative on pharmacological intervention for delirium, but what, briefly, what's your thoughts on its, its nuanced role and what drug? Is that for me? Um, well, I'll quickly say that I, I mean, I'm not totally opposed to the use of antipsychotics. I think ICU is a different world and I don't really talk about that, but outside of ICU, I think that there is, there is, there are no studies that really convince me that, that you've got delirium and then you give a drug. What I do think though is that somebody has got terrible psychosis and no amount of reassurance and kindness and being a relative being there is helping then a trial for two or three days of risperidone or, or, or even a benzodiazepine, if you have to use that, isn't unreasonable because it's a, it's almost a humanitarian thing. You know, it's to reduce anxiety and fear. So I think but what I really can't stand is when people get a delirium and then they get put on a drug. And also, even if they are a little bit restless and distressed and you can't help them without drugs, you put them on a drug and then they stay on it for weeks. You know, that's wrong. So I think I, I would say one or two doses, maybe three days max, you know, risperidone 250 micrograms or halperidol half a milligram or maybe a benzodiazepine a little bit. We've been using that a bit more with COVID, you know, just to help people keep their masks on, you know, and, and, and feel less frightened, you know, and I think there is a role for benzos there. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying those words, but, um, you know, I think you have to be pragmatic, you know, but I think it's got to be a senior decision and a careful decision when you use drugs and delirium. It's never a routine thing. Thanks, and sorry to put that difficult question to you. Uh, and, and thanks to all the panellists also for, for their contributions. I might hand you over now to Professor Roseanne Kenny, the President of the Society. Thank you. Yeah, well, actually, Roseanne, I'll just say a quick word there. Just say to Cara... Yeah, no, no, that's grand. We'll let Dermot wrap up, I think, yeah. I just need to say to Cara and to uh, Louise, the talk they gave, and Alistair really touched on this, highlighted the importance of champions and local quality improvement initiatives. And for all the conversation, I mean, this is as good an update on delirium as I've heard in a long time. I mean, you've well done you know, really fantastic. And I think all this to say is what, uh, you know, Dan said, thanks a million to Neve, to our, to our speakers. Uh, and just to remind everybody, December the 3rd, the 7th and the 17th. So December the 3rd, we have a Falls and Syncopy webinar. December the 7th, we have Ages and Policy and Language, a really interesting talk. And uh, on December the 17th, a Christmas miscellany. So keep your eye out for those on the website. <laughs> That'll be an interesting one. Thank you all very much. A fantastic hour and a half. Well done to you all. <laughs> Hi guys, listen, um, thank you very much. Uh, really good, really good guys. Uh, a fantastic talk, thanks Mel. Really thank good. you, thank you. We'll be, we'll be uh, thanks touch. Alistair, we'll be see Alistair, you. Alistair, your time. Bye now. Thanks, uh, I enjoyed that a lot, thank cheers. Uh, bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Paul, thanks.